Well, I'm very excited about our next guest. His name is Pat Brown. He's the CEO and founder of Impossible Foods, a company that is at the forefront of making nutritious, delicious meat and dairy products from plants to satisfy meat eaters and address environmental impact of animal farming. So please welcome Pat. Hi, Pat. Hey. Take a seat, please. Well, it's, it's great to see you here. And I wanted to, to say uh, congratulations, because I know the Impossible Burger is at Burger King now. Yeah, it's at Burger King. It's uh, um, spreading nationwide. We're, we're in a few, we're in about 300 restaurants. We'll be in 8,000 by the end of the year. And uh, it's doing incredibly well. Yeah, super successful. Uh, I was reading that uh, since it uh, entered Burger King, they have an 18% um, raise in the amount of people, of traffic that they receive on, on the restaurant. So that's, that's pretty wonderful. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it doesn't work if it's not successful for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, they've had like something like a 20 or even more than 20% increase in their overall traffic and overall sales. Um, that they attribute to launching the Impossible Whopper, and um, so I don't know. Here, could we do a race of hands? Who has tried the Impossible Burger here? It's pretty delicious, wow. right? <laughs> Thank I, I, you all. <laughs> uh, I have to say that uh, when I tried it, I'm a vegetarian, and when I tried it, uh, it just tastes so much like meat that I was. Uh, I have doubts <laughs> that it was uh -huh. <laughs> plant-based, but um, but I, I would like you to share a little bit about. Uh, the history of this company, and where did you get the inspiration to create it, and, and how have you come to this point? Oh, wow, well, okay, I'll try to give you as fast an answer as I can. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I never set out to be in the food industry, and, um, but I was, uh, I was a biomedical researcher, a professor at the medical school at Stanford, and um, doing just basic, trying to understand how cells work and gene regulation stuff. And, um, but I had a sabbatical that I used to um, try to pick the most important problem in the world that I could contribute to solving. And as soon as I, very quickly, when I started to look, look for it, I realized that the problem was the catastrophic environmental impact of the use of animals as a food technology. Um, nothing even comes remotely close. So, um, as I think everybody here already knows, so I probably don't even have to go down the list, but it's, you know, uh, um, responsible for at least 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's by far the biggest user of fresh water, by far the biggest polluter of fresh water of any industry on Earth. Um, it occupies uh, almost 50% of the entire land area of planet Earth it is actively being used to raise animals for food, either grazing or growing feed crops. Um, and that has come at the tremendous expense of biodiversity. So we are in the pretty advanced stages of a catastrophic meltdown in global biodiversity. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund reported um, a couple of years ago that the total number of wild animals across the board, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, uh, fish, and even uh, insects, is less than half what it was 40 years ago. So in 40 years, we've managed to wipe out, um, in terms of the sheer numbers, half the wild animals on Earth. And, it's, and according to them, it's almost entirely due to the use of animals in the food system. You know, overfishing in, in, for, for fish and uh, habitat destruction and degradation for um, land-based animals. And, um, and so we're at the stage where Right now, the total biomass of cows living on Earth is more than 10 times greater than the total biomass of every mammal, bird, reptile, and amphibian living on Earth. So the cows are overwhelmingly the dominant creature um, on the planet. If you just take the total mass of animals that we eat every year, it's six times greater than the total mass of every wild animal on Earth. So uh, every wild land animal on Earth. So it's just totally out of control. And, um, and that is gonna have, biodiversity loss is gonna have a catastrophic impact because the biodiversity is essential for the st stability of ecosystems that keep mm -hmm. this planet viable. And you can't just trash it 
and expect to get away with it. So I'm sorry for the rant. So anyway, um, when I realized that, I felt like, okay, I have to, this is, nobody is seriously trying to solve this problem. We have to replace animals with food technology and there was just nothing being done. And I also realized, which I think is self-evident, is that you're not gonna solve the problem by telling people to change their diets. Um, good luck with that. I applaud the people um, here who are working to educate people and so forth. But I think um, all you have to do is look at the fact that, um, you know, uh, the, uh, you go to any climate conference and essentially all the meals have meat and fish and dairy in them. And, um, and you know, um, even governments, China advised its citizens to cut back their meat and dairy consumption by half. And two years ago, nothing. You can't even see a blip in the upward trajectory as a result. So it basically says this is a failed strategy. Not, not, not I applaud people who keep trying, but I, I, I don't think it's gonna work. And that meant that you had to approach it as a technology problem, that we're using the wrong technology to produce these foods. We're using a prehistoric technology that's incredibly inefficient and destructive and hasn't fundamentally improved in millennia. And as a biochemist, I thought, okay, actually, that's a problem I can, I can solve because, because really you need to make, to, in, order to, in order to replace animals in the food system, you need to make foods that deliver what consumers want. Not just something that you want them to want, it has to be something that they want. Yeah. And, and they care about deliciousness above all, nutrition and affordability and convenience and so forth. Well, nutrition is easy. It's easy to make something that outperforms mm -hmm. you know, meat from animals in terms of nutritional profile. Cost is is in many ways easy because if you're using less of all the resources that drive the cost of animals, you know, less land, less water, less fertilizer, less pesticides, less labor, um, you have a cost advantage. The hard part is deliciousness. And um, so when I founded the company, with the goal being to develop a technology to completely replace animals in the food system and compete in the market against the foods from animals, um, I started with the premise that the most important scientific question in the world wasn't what I had been working on at Stanford. It was understanding what makes meat delicious. If, if you can answer the question, what makes meat delicious, you can solve, you can eliminate the greatest environmental threat our planet has ever faced, which is the catastrophic impact of animal-based foods on, on the planet. And so, I founded Impossible Foods as a business with the goal of creating foods that could compete successfully against all the foods we get from animals in the global market and basically um, win by, let, the, let the so-called invisible hand of the market take care of the rest, so, basically. Um, let, let's go back a bit. So how long ago was this that you created Impossible Foods? And if you would go back to this place and you tell the people that you were going to create this uh, hamburger that tastes delicious and everybody was going to love and maybe some meat eaters would leave the meat behind, um, what did they say at that time when you decided to launch the company? Well, my scientist colleagues, you know, the thing about scientists is they love wild ideas. So actually they were incredibly supportive. Um, uh, but, um, and the investors that I went to, they were venture investors, they also sort of love wild ideas and they love the fact that basically the, the critical thing to investors is this is a, at the time, one and a half trillion dollar global market that's being served by a prehistoric technology that hasn't improved in millennia and is demonstrably one of the least efficient technologies on Earth, um, it kind of reads to them as, oh, okay, actually, this is worth putting some money into. Um, so the people I talked to actually were surprisingly supportive of the idea. And I, I had complete confidence from day one. I knew this was a solvable problem and I am even more confident, uh, even more confident now. And, and one thing I think that's really important to understand is that the only consumer we care about with our meat products is the hardcore meat eater. And we have learned something interesting about meat lovers, which would be interesting. I'm assuming here, don't be ashamed, that most people here are regular meat eaters and, and I love you, you're my future customers. <laughs> and, um, but um, 
But the question is, how many people here uh, love meat in part because of the way it's made, because it's made from the cadaver of a, an animal? Yeah, that's exactly the same response we get in the US, that meat lovers love meat, they're not gonna stop wanting to love, uh, eat meat, they love it because it's delicious, because it's a good source of protein and iron, it's convenient, affordable, in spite of the fact that it's made from the cadaver of an animal, which no meat lover likes. So what it means is if you can just deliver the stuff they care about, actually people think, oh, meat lovers are never gonna stop wanting to eat animals. No, they don't. They only eat animals because they're delicious, but if you can, if you can give them something delicious that's not made from an animal, they're ready. And I, wanna, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, we know that it's very delicious and it takes very much uh, like real meat. Could you tell us about the nutritious values of, of your product? Um, yeah, well, in a nutshell, so what, what, what meat lovers value in uh, nutrition from meat um, as, part of a, you know, as a part of their diet, above all, is the protein content, the protein quality, iron, certain micronutrients, zinc, B, B vitamins, and so forth. Um, so we made a point of making sure that the protein content and the protein quality, actually the protein quality of our burger is higher than the protein quality of beef from a cow, and the, the amount is essentially the same. Um, the iron content is the same, same B vitamins, same zinc, same micronutrients, and so forth, so that a consumer who is, um, views meat as an important component of, of their diet gets what they wanted. But it's lower in calories, lower in total fat, lower in saturated fat, and zero cholesterol. And, I, I, and also doesn't come pre-contaminated with fecal bacteria. So it's got a lot of nutritional advantages. Oh, definitely. Um, well, in this whole revolution of new products that are not meat, but taste very much like it, how do we make sure that they don't become a distraction for, for the real changes in behavior that we need to see? Well, I would say we don't need... So, it would be great if you could just convince people to choose plant-based foods that are already on the market instead of meat. And if that was the case, I would go back to my old job because um, I, don't need, I don't need the aggravation. But, um, but the fact is that uh, it's been tried repeatedly and that just doesn't work. And um, so instead of changing people's behavior, instead of changing uh, the choices they make, make those choices better for them better for public health, better for the planet. Um, that doesn't matter if they don't change their behavior. They can keep eating all the meat they want as long as it's not causing this environmental and public health catastrophe. I mean, our, the meat that we make has one-ninth the greenhouse gas emissions, one-eighth the water use, one-twelfth the fertilizer consumption, and less than one-twenty-fifth the land required to produce it with all the biodiversity impact of land usage. And so, who cares if they're not choosing to eat, you know, lentils instead of beef? They're not causing the problem anymore. What do you see as, as the future of your company, like in 10 years? What do you see in Possible Foods? Well, our mission is to completely replace animals in the food system by 2035. So, and you laugh, but we are absolutely serious about it. And I think it's, it's doable, and I'll just say, better technology wins in the market. And, you know, from the time the first super crappy low-resolution digital camera came on the market until Kodak basically shut down its film business was about 10 years. And so if you can make something that outperforms in delivering what consumers want, okay, um, the market can work fast. Mm -hmm. So where do we want to be in 10 years? Well, we want to be well along that trajectory. And so far, I would say we're on the trajectory that we set for ourselves. And, and everything yeah. is moving so fast. Uh, so definitely, I think that is a possibility. I know that today you're launching a report, a very important impact report. Could you tell us about it? Yeah, I, uh, basically every year... So the company is completely mission-based, okay? Mm -hmm. I founded the company. I did never wanted to be in the business world and so forth. It's completely mission-based. And so we're extremely meticulous both in terms of how we create our product and, and for, for nutri you know, looking at its nutritional impact and, 
and environmental impact and so forth. And every time we do a reformulation or a process improvement, you know, every year we're auditing, we get an independent auditor to do a life cycle analysis and give us a report back. And we've sort of made a commitment that we're going to publish it so that people can, you know, evaluate how they should think about us. And so this is our impact report, which basically is a summary of all the envir relevant environmental impacts of, of our production process and our supply chain, and also how we try to have a positive impact on communities and our own employees and so forth, yeah. Well, wonderful. I, I truly congratulate you for being uh, such a visionary and for, for, I mean, supporting so much this uh, food transformation. All the Thank success you. to you. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you very Pat. much. <laughs> Great to meet you.